do it. Where did we stop last time? So we learned how to make our own. We learned how to test those functions as well to have some hope that they're kind of correct. We started using that assert true, right? Asserting that like this Boolean expression should be true. We want it to be true. That means the test passes. Otherwise, the test fails. Stuff like that. Uh, now I want to get into some more of the nitty gritty details. So the first thing I want to tell you is about the stack. This magical thing called the stack. Uh, people like to put words before that as well. They call it like the runtime stack or the call stack or the function call stack. It has to do with how functions are being called and returning. So let me teach you what this little thing is. So this is going to try and answer these questions. Like what, what in the world is C++ doing when I'm calling a function? Or like how does C++ know to like return back to the line right this time, and then when I call the function again, how does it know to return back to the line below that that call? That's that's kind of interesting how it can remember that stuff. How does it do it? It's like we called in our uh, example from last time, like the main function called the square function, right? Square, and then square needed to return back to main. First of all, it's the answer, and then it just needed to know how to go to that line as well. It's very interesting. So let's talk about what's going on under the hood inside of your computer as functions are getting called, right? So uh, let's pretend that main calls a sum function, sum calls a square function, and then sum returns back to square, all right? So here's the diagram. It's like a, a stack of papers. Boop, boop. I'm going to draw it like that. It's going to be built up. But at the very beginning of your program, no functions have been called, not even main yet, okay? So it's like an empty stack of things to do. And so every time you call a function, it gets, uh, it gets pushed onto the stack, we say. That's the technical term. We push something onto the stack, like you're shoving it as the new amount of work that you need to do. So main is getting called. It's the first piece of information. It's the first thing that gets pushed onto this function call stack, main. And so that's, that's kind of what's going on in memory. We'll talk about that more. Uh, and then the stack is how functions know where to return back to. So uh, if main calls sum, what happens when sum gets called for main is we add a new little rectangle. It's called a stack frame. We add a new box on the stack to the top of it. We push it to indicate that we're trying to run sum now. And do you see how easy it is to know who to return back to? It's just sum, sum knows very easily that it's going to go back to main because that's the person below it on the stack. Stack of work to be done. All right, and then sum, let's pretend, calls the square function. So inside of sum, we're still working on sum, not done with it yet. It goes off and it calls a different function called square. All right, and now square is the one running right now, but these two guys are waiting on results. See that? Square, sum is waiting on square, and main is waiting on sum, who is itself waiting on square. So there's three functions being called right now. That's kind of how you can draw it. It's a new stack frame. And so they all know to where to return to. Square knows to return back to sum. That's the person below it on the stack. Sum knows to return back to main. That's the person below it on the stack. And uh, every function, this, by the way, is like a legitimate place in memory. If nothing else, it's storing the local variables for every function. Every function has its own memory for its local variables. So like maybe main has an x variable. I've been drawing an x variable like out here before, but Secretly, the real way to draw it is inside of the stack frame. It's mains x variable. It's mains a variable. It's mains b variable. Those exist. All right? And that's completely different from maybe sums function, which has a local variable called a or maybe a parameter called b. It has its own memory with different, with maybe the same name that, that is getting made when the function calls, gets called. And uh, square maybe it has like the x parameter. And so it has its all. Every function has its own memory. And then once square returns, it, give, it like gives its answer back to, to sum, it is the opposite of pushed. It is popped off the stack to indicate that it's done. It's returning back to sum, and now we're back in the sum function and running code there. All right? And then when sum's done, it will pop itself back off the stack, give its answer back, give its sum back that was meant to return. It returns it back to main. Then we start executing again. But do you see how it's keeping track of where to go next? It's like you return back to the person below you on this thing called the stack. All right? We'll go into more detail about it later, but it, it figures out, it stores where to return back to, and it stores all of the local variables, all the variables that are defined 
in every function and parameters count as variables. Any questions about any of that? It's kind of high level, uh, a little vague. But every function has its own memory for its local variables. That's a key thing. So have we been reading in our book? Like, do we know what local variable means? Ooh -hoo. Uh, let me give you a demonstration of the difference. There's, there are things called global variables, and then there's things called local variables. Let me tell you the difference between the two. And I will use Harry Potter as an example, because I am a millennial. And so this is a fun, uh, fun idea. So Harry Potter, if we're all Gen Z in this class, we don't like Harry Potter. Uh, he's like the boy who lived, like he dies a bunch of times but doesn't, comes back to life. So Harry Potter, boy who lived. And then this is, spoiler alert, book four. This dude, Cedric, he dies, all right? So he's going to be the local variable. He's going to go away after a function call, and we're going to make Harry Potter the global variable, all right? That's going to be how this works. So variables, if you define a variable outside of any function, it becomes a global variable. So we're going to define Harry outside of any function call, and then we are going to define Cedric inside of, like, a function call uh, as a local variable, just the variable for the function itself, and after that function returns, it's going to reclaim that memory so that the next time you call something else, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take that same spot. And so it will be overwritten. It does not live. All right, so let me, let's make a silly example of this with Harry Potter as a theme. All right, uh, local versus global dot cpp. So uh, if you make a variable outside of any function, like here, it lives forever. Harry, this is, will be our Harry Potter variable. We can have him set to 42, right? This is a global variable. It lives for the life of the program. Because you don't know who's going to need it. Anybody can access it because it's way out here. It's like it's, it's available for anybody to use. So it's, it's global. It, it lasts for the whole program. It never goes away. But local variables, like things if I define them inside main, like int x or whatever, those are local, and they will go away when the function returns, all right? So let's, let's make a, a function for uh, the book where this character dies. It's goblet of fire. So let's make a goblet of fire function, all right? And we'll call that for main. And here's, here's the setup. So I'm going to make a... Cedric variable. That's the the unfortunate dude who, who does not make it past this book. Uh, I'll set him here. And this makes a local variable. Right? Anything that you make, any variable, all the variables you've been making so far, they're all local variables. This is a local variable. It lives only as long as the function itself lives. So if the function returns, all that memory gets reclaimed and it goes away. Right? And, of course, I can mess with Cedric. He's up here. I can, I can add to him. I can print him out, access his values. Totally fine. Uh, and then, also, I can access this Harry Potter variable anywhere. He's global. So I can talk about him here, Harry Potter++. plus plus. Output him. And I can also talk about him in main. Down here, it's like Harry Potter++. plus plus. I'll put him after that function is called. So that's all well and good because Harry is global. I can ask him about him anywhere. So let's run this. And it will do probably what you expect. So I'm seeing 943.44. Why? So Harry Potter, at the start of the program is set to 42. We, we go to main, which calls Goblet of Fire. So we jump up here. Set Cedric to 8, uh, Cedric is 9, print 9, there we go. Harry Potter++, plus plus, he was 42, now he's 43, we can access him anywhere, there's my 43. And then this function returns back to main, so we start running this code. Harry Potter++, plus plus, well he was 43, now he's 44, print him, and that's the program. Any questions about this so far? Just, if you make a variable outside of anything, it, it lives forever and it, it's global. You can access it anywhere. Alright? Cedric, sadly... He dies after this function returns back to main. All right, so I can't do this. I can't say down here. I can't ask about him in main. All right, this will not even compile. 
looks like Cedric was not declared in this scope. He existed up here, but down here he has been reclaimed, so Cedric is already dead. Sad face. All right. Any questions about why that's, that's, that's happening? It's just, this was a local variable to this function. It exists for the life of that function. We went and called it in main, but now it's done. And we don't have that memory anymore. That's the idea. So, yeah, you got to comment that out for it to work. Um, and now let me draw you a diagram of this stack, what's going on in this function. All right, the stack and the globals, they're separate places. So, like, when main gets called... This happens, of course. We make a stack frame for main and all of its local variables. And then there's also a separate place in memory for the global variables, because those never go away. Those need to be over here somewhere else. All right? So like at the start of the program, main gets called, and then we set a global variable, Harry Potter, to 42. Both of those things are like happening at the same time. So he starts out being 42. And we're in main right now, all right? And then main calls goblet of fire, so we're pushing that function call onto the stack so it knows to return back to main. We goblet of fire. And that's where we make a Cedric variable. We make Cedric set to eight. He's local. He's local to goblet of fire, so this is where he lives. Cedric set to eight. See that? Big difference. And then we say plus plus on him and print him. So nine. That's why we see nine as our first output line. And then we can mess with Harry anywhere. Like, here he is. Harry Potter plus plus, 43. Print the 43. You can always access him. And then we return back. Right? So what happens now is Goblet of Fire returns back to main. All of this memory goes away. It gets reclaimed. Now we're sitting back in main. It's the top of our stack. The current thing we're working on. And so we start running these lines. It knew, it knew to come back to the line after the Goblet of Fire call. That's where it returns to. And then that messes with Harry and... Uh, Prints it out. So that's why we see that particular output, and this is what's going on secretly in memory the whole time. Any questions about any of that? So global variables. Now you know. All right. Um, I think I accidentally had a separate, an extra thing there. Didn't need it. Um, all right. Let's talk about a new concept called references. This is going to be very helpful as we're passing things to functions and back, all right? Because there's something we can't do right now, and I'll try and answer these questions. Uh, so like, if you have a value and you pass it to a function, it's really getting copied right now. We don't know that, but I'll, I'll tell you that in just a second. You might want to modify that original thing that you're passing, though. So that's something that will be on your mind one day. And then also, we have return types, right? You can say, I would like Goblet of Fire to return an int. And you say, return that thing, or main returns an int. And then you can give back that one thing. How can you return multiple things? Surely that should be possible. So let's see how to do that. References will answer both of these questions, right? So here's what a reference is. All it is is an alias. It's like a secret agent. It's an alias for a variable. It's just another name for something that's already there, all right? An alias, a, re a reference is an alias for a variable that already exists. It takes up no memory on its own. It's just a thing for you, the programmer. All right? So to make a reference, you give the original type of the thing you're aliasing, and then you attach an ampersand to it. And that means it's a reference to that kind of thing. All right? So let, let me give you an example. So if I make a normal variable, int x, a local variable, 42. That makes a normal box in memory as we know and love. Set it to 42. Cool. I would like to make an alias to x now, though. I want to make a reference to x, and maybe I'll call it z, and here's how you do that. I'd like to make another name for this existing box, maybe call it z. That's what I want to do right now. All right? Two names for the same box in memory. So the way you do that is you say, well, what's the type of z? It's a reference to this int variable. So its full type is an int ampersand. The ampersand means it's a reference. It's a reference to an int. You kind of read it backwards. And then I say, all right, its name is going to be Z, and it's going to alias X. That's what you say. All right? So you read this line as, if I can get zoom out of the way, you read this line as Z is a reference to X. 
all right? And so here's what's going on under the hood in memory. We really have just given another name to that same box. And so if you say Z++, it is exactly equivalent to saying X++. It, it means no, uh, it means nothing different at this point. They are the same exact box in memory. X is Z, Z is X. They're just another name for the same exact thing. Okay? Any questions about that so far? It's just another name. It's a way to rename a box. It's very weird to want to do, but it's going to be a very powerful concept, I promise. Right. Uh, by the way, this ampersand can go anywhere. I like to put it next to the type because it's like part of the type in my opinion. It's like Z is an int reference. That's what it is. That's its type of thing that it stores. Uh, but you can put the ampersand next to the type, in the middle, or next to the variable. You'll see that. You know, you'll see all these options in the wild. It doesn't matter. So uh, put the ampersand where you feel like putting it, but I'll put it next to the type, I think. Uh, and again, you just read it as X is a reference to y. y must be an integer if you're putting an ampersand and saying int, okay? But the space doesn't matter. Okay, so let me show that to you in code. References. Let's just make a normal, a normal variable and then a reference to it, just all on main right now. And then we'll talk about what this means across function calls, because that's, that's where it really matters. So int x equals 42, I've made my x box, and now I want to make a reference to x called z, right? So that's the, the syntax. z is a reference to x, okay? And so now, if I print, I can talk about that same box of memory two different ways. It has two names. I can see out x, I can see out z. I could say x++, plus plus, and I will see 43 twice again. Or I could say z++, plus plus. it's really the same thing. X is Z, Z is X. There is no difference at this point. Just another name for the same exact thing. All right, so it really is doing exactly what you would expect right now. 42, 42, twice. Z is X. They're the same box. They're, they're never going to disagree. I can mess with X, and that messes with Z, of course, because they're the same box. I can mess with Z, and that, of course, messes with X. So... They are all, they're attached to each other. They are the same place in memory. That's what it means to be a reference. Any questions about that? You're probably wondering what, what is this at all good for? Why would I do anything like this? So here, let me show you. Uh, let's do a more complicated example. Or let, let me just draw what's going on in memory when I change values. And then, then I'll show you an interesting fact, all right? So, all right, let's have an example with an int y this time. That can be our normal local variable, just a normal int. So this line makes the y variable in memory, sets it to 42. And then you can use y as long as you want. But then you can also come along later and say int reference x equals y. And that makes x another name for that same box in memory. So this is what it looks like if I draw that diagram. And now I could say y plus plus. And that'll, of course, make this 43. Or I could say x++. Plus plus, and that will change the same box. x++ plus plus will make this 44 now. All right? No difference. And so if I see out x or see out y, it's like it's going here. It's getting the value in the box. So I'm going to see 44 twice because they are, they are the same exact thing. I hope that makes even more sense now. Are we still all right? Okay. So now, now let's use it. Let's see why we would want this. It happens with function calls. Something weird's going on. And so let's, let's talk about what happens when you pass along something to a function. This is going to be very technical, but it's very much worth knowing, I promise. So what's going on on the stack when we pass a value as an argument to a function? All right? So uh, I'm going to make some, some function in a second as an example, but here's here's what I like to explain it as. There's like there's a special place. There's a magical place. I'll call it the interfunction dreamland, where those parameters that you're passing, or the parameters that are existing in the definition of your function, those are getting set to the arguments that you're passing along. There's a place where that happens, and it's before the function starts executing its body, remember. Alright? So that's the interfunction dreamland. And so for a split second like, one function's variables exist, and another function's variables exist at the same time. 
which is a little weird to think about. So here's an example of an increment function. All right. I'll call this call by val and ref .cpp for a reason. So let me make a variable x. Int x equals 42. Dun, dun, dun. And um, I'm going to then make an increment function. All right. The first one's the normal way. It's called by value, passing along things. I'm going to make an increment function. I'll say inc by val. Uh, by value on x, and then I'll print x, dun, dun, dun. and then I'll say void inc by val, I'll get, I'll call it a up here, and then I'll say a plus plus. So this is a function. I've made, I made x down here, passed along x, it's being passed into a, and then I'm incrementing a, and then I'm, after this return, after this returns, I'm printing x. So, what do we think it's going to be printing here on the on the line 12? Take your bets. What do you think it's going to print there? I'm passing x, which holds 42, into a, incrementing a. This gets done, it returns, and then I get to print x again. What is going to be output? 42. And there's a very weird reason why, and it, it's going to make so much sense once I, once I explain it, I promise. But it's printing 42 right now, which is not at all what we expected to print, right? This is very weird. It doesn't make sense. So let's, let's see why. What's going on, all right? Let's draw a stack diagram. So main has x. That's where x lives. When main gets called, we have our x variable set to 42, cool, x 42. And then we call inc by val with x as the argument. So then we, we make this call. We're up here, inc by val. And this is where interesting things happen, inc by val. So this inc by val function has a parameter called a. Parameters are just variables for that function. They get set in a special way, though. So here is a. It's separate. It's different from x. You see that? That's the first thing to notice. And then also, how is it being set? There is this interfunction dreamland where for a split second, a and x exist at the same time, on the same, like, on the same plane. So what's going on is someone somewhere, deep down in C++, is saying int a equals this value of x. It's making that variable, making the parameter for this function. Somebody somewhere is saying in the dreamland, int a equals x. It's defining that a parameter, and it's giving it the value that we passed along. So a and x exist for a split second at the same time. And that's going to place the 42 into the a variable. And it's just a parameter, uh, so it is local to the function inc by val. And so we can mess with a all day long, a++, plus plus, make it 43. So we did make something 43, but this function will return. Bam, all of its memory goes away, a dies. And now we're back in main, and we print x, and x didn't change. Do you see what happened there? That's the secret. That's going on. That's what happens when you pass along values in the normal way that we know how to functions. All right? That's what's going on. So somebody's setting a to x, and it is its own little variable. It's like an int. It's like somebody's declaring it up here. A parameter is just a local variable to the function. It's just set in a very special way when you call it with an argument. All right? So that's what's going on. This is called call by value parameter passing or argument passing. All right? This, this a is a call by value parameter, we say. All right? Which means that copies are getting made. It's going to copy in whatever is being passed along into its own place, and it can't mess with the other thing. Copies get made. But I think you can imagine that this function was made so that it could increment that x. We would want that for this special case. A lot of the time we don't. We do want to make copies and not touch the original value, but this kind of function, it's just screaming that it wants to mess with the x variable. It wants to mess with somebody else's memory in this function. All right? The way to do that is to use 
references. To make it the parameter a reference. To make a call by reference parameter. Okay? So here is the exact same idea, but I'm going to change one thing about this function. I'm going to make, um, instead of inc by val, I'll call it inc by ref. So new name, but everything else will be the same. Inc by val, inc by ref, and then the final change is this parameter, it's not going to be a normal int, it's going to be an int ampersand. It's going to be an int reference, all right? And so what does that mean when I call it? Somebody's going to say int reference a equals x, right? In that interfunction dreamland. And that means a is another name for mains x. And it will mess with it. It will work this time. Now, oh, I need to save the file. That would be helpful. Bam, there's my 43. So adding that reference there makes all the difference. It really is going to be passing along the real X, that box. And it's going to be uh, touching it when it says stuff without A. All right? So let me show you what's going on there. So... Same deal. We had main. We're back in main now because ink by val returned. Mains x still held 42, sadly. And then we called ink by ref this time. And for a reason, when it gets called, I'm going to draw everything that ink by ref owns in green. Ink by ref gets called, so we make space for it on the call stack. Ref. And then what is its variables involved in this function? It only has a, which is a parameter. Uh, somebody, somewhere, once this call happens, right, we say we call it on x. In that dream land, somebody is saying, it, somebody's making that parameter. Somebody's saying int reference a, because that's the name of the parameter, and it's being set to the value that we pass along, the x. So a and x exist for a split second, even though they live in different places. You know, they're both local, kind of. Somebody's doing this, and that initializes A to be a reference to X. And what does that mean? It's another name for this box down here. So the green A is now another name for mains X. That's why I had to use a different color. So now, now A is set up to be that same another name for that same box. A++ does mess with this memory, 43. Cool. And then this returns... So A doesn't exist, like this, you can't say A anymore, but you can still, of course, say X. X lives in main, and we can print out its value, and it has magically changed. Wow. Just one, one difference, changing the parameter type from this to this. Now that you see how they're being set, right? It's, it's essentially somebody's making this line happen in each call. That's how you set parameters to, to arguments. Any questions about any of that? It's so definitely a little weird of a concept to see for the first time, but I promise you'll get it. By default, you're doing call by value. You're making copies of things. You're not messing with anybody else's memory. It's all your own now, unless you start adding references to your parameters. Then you're really touching somebody else's memory, which is nice. Sometimes. All right? So that's one thing that references are good for. Uh, also... They're just good for saving memory, because let's say that you had some big long vector that you wanted to pass along to a function, like maybe you made a sum function to sum all the values in a vector and give back the sum. And you passed along, like you were trying to sum all the values in like a million sized vector, it was huge. Da, da, da. If you used call by value, like you passed along a, a vector of ints, a copy would get made just for that function to go and sum everything, right? You'd have to make its own vector, size a million. Maybe you'd run out of memory because you don't have that much memory in your computer. And then it would just sum this, and then it would go away, and then you'd return. That is disgusting. Why can't we just pass this memory? Not copy a million things. Pass along a vector into reference. Oh, so that would allow for no copying to get made, to get done. So that's another thing that references are good at. They save memory so that when you pass along things to functions that are large, you're not copying them unnecessarily, and that's saving you a lot of time because I think you can imagine that like, to copy this vector, C++ has to go make a giant thing and then put every value in the right spot. That takes a lot of time. All right? So that saves time. Any questions about that idea?
Those are kind of the two things that references are good at. Messing with somebody else's memory, and then also saving memory at the same time. Due to a lack of copying. All right, if we're happy, I have a question for us to do on the buy clicker page. Please go there. I'll stop attendance after Don that, so please do attendance if you're not. But let me start the question, then I'll, I'll send it off to you guys to go and work on it together. But here are your options. Here's some code, these five lines. Run them in your mind or on paper. Tell me, what does memory look like after all of these lines have finished running? Does it, look like, does it look like A, B, C, or D? I promise that one of those is the right answer. See if you can figure out which one is the right one. And please yell at me if you have questions. So references make aliases. How many? Which ones are different? Please help each other. All right, a few more seconds. Get your answer, your best guess in. My timer says three, two, one. There it goes. All right, let's see what we think. What a beautiful normal distribution. We have C as the as the answer that we believe. Um, but we're not so sure. So we have some ends on both sides. We we think it might be C. Definitely can't be E though. Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. C is the right answer, by the way. So let's let's figure this out. So C is correct. Uh, so thank you all. And I promise to stop that. Let's see why C is the answer. This will work out. So all right. First of all, look at how many lines don't have an ampersand. That tells you immediately how many separate boxes are being made in memory. So that, that can knock off A and D immediately. But then what, what is what is what? What corresponds to what? So int x equals 42. That makes the x box. Setting it to 42. And then we say y is a reference to x. So y is another name for the same box right there. That's what happens. And then z, int z equals y. This is a fun one. Uh, it makes a new box, right? There's no ampersand, so it's making a z. And it's setting it to the value of y, which is the same as the value of x, because they're the same place, setting it to 42. Okay? 
And then we say int reference p equals z. So p is a reference to z. It's another name for it. And then uh, q is a reference to y. So q is another name for the box that y is talking about. And so that's what's going on in memory. So that is what c is saying. Any questions about it? You get that? Does it make enough sense? An easy way, if like Zybooks or I ever did on a test, ask you about how to like ask you this exact question, a very easy way to find the answer is every name here, take every name and set them to different things. Set x to 43, set y to 44, set z to 45, set everybody, every single letter you see here to a different value, and then print them all out. The ones that correspond must be the same box. If you think about that long enough, it'll make sense. That's, that's a trick, I guess. So you're changing them all. The last value, they would all, if anybody agrees, then they must have corresponded. They must have been the same box in memory. So that's that. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's references. That's all that I want to say about them for now. Are there any questions about them before I move to a completely different topic? All right. So I want to talk about how to write bigger programs that use multiple C++ files. Because I'm sure by now, like, you're seeing, you're noticing how big our files are getting. Sure, they have ni nice separate functions, and so they're logically separated, but it's still a big, long .cpp file, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we could split up some, some of the functions that did thing A from some of the functions that did thing B in separate files? That's what we'd like, all right? So the secret, the way to get that is to make separate CPP files with separate implementations, but you also have to make things called .h files or header files, all right? There is, uh, this essentially allows us to make our own libraries. Like we can include our library in some other file. And so you have to make a .h file and a .cpp file for that thing, all right? So first of all, .h means header file. Those end in .h, .hpp, or .hxx. Your book uses .h, so we will use .h in this class. Uh, and so a .h file is where you declare all of the functions in the library you're trying to make for yourself. So all your declarations go uh, of all the functions that you're promising to make and implement. They all go in the .h file. Go here. All right. So we are promising to make a foo function and a bar function with these exact parameter types and these return values. So that's what it means to be a header file. And then you usually use the same name, foo.h. You have foo.cpp that implements all of those functions that you have promised to, to make in the header file. So the implementation files, they all, they, they're going to have the same name usually, but they end with the normal stuff, .cpp. There are other things. You don't have to use .cpp. Use .cc, .capital C, some people use, .cxx, because you can't have a plus in a file name, so they just turned the plus sideways and made it an X. Oh, your book uses .cpp, so that's what we, we will use. Uh, so here's the corresponding implementation file for the library. And so all the functions that you declared or defined in, uh, in the .h file get implemented here. You give them bodies are implemented here. Implemented here. And then every time you want to use it in like another file, you want to move you want to use your foo function and your bar function in, in some other file, maybe with a main function, you include it like you've been including every other library. You say number sign include and then you give the name of the header file. That's all you need to give. You give the name of the header file and that tells it how it can use those things. It's happy. Uh, you do use quotes, though, for your stuff. Library special stuff, that's all you can use those angle brackets for. That knows to go and look in the library uh, folder. If you use single quotes, or sorry, double quotes, that goes and looks in your current folder when you're compiling. That's, that's what we want here. It's our own stuff. Those, those angle brackets are system libraries only. We're making our own. And then, uh, it's also customary to just get in the habit of including your header file in your implementation file. Uh, I guess we'll have to wait until classes to, reason, to learn why, but it's just a good habit to get into. Uh, so 
There's that, and then to compile, if you want to make a final file that like brings together this implementation with this use of the implementation, these two CPP, CPP files together, you compile with G++ and you give both of them. You're like, here's the implementation of the foo library, here's the main function that I want you to use, and it's going to use the library. You don't have to give the .h file for a reason that I will explain in a couple slides. But that's kind of the setup. You can separate things into .h files and corresponding .cpp files. The .h files have the declaration of your library functions, the .cpp files have the implementations of your library functions, and then anywhere you want to use them, you can include them. And then they're accessible. All right, so that's that. Uh, so let's take that long string of stuff that we did before, that sum of squares functionality, let's take all that and package it into a sum of squares library. All right, so uh, let's go back to that. Okay, let me copy it in just real quick from last time. So this was um, copy lecture 11's uh, sum of squares dot cpp here. So this is this file. Remember this? We made these three functions, we declared them, we implemented them down here, we used them in the main function. This has kind of got a lot going on in one file, so let's, let's split it up. All right, let's make a main.cpp, and that will take care of having the main function. That's where it can live. Then we'll make a sum of squares.h a header file that holds the declarations of all the library stuff. This can be our library functions, all these things, add square, sum of squares from one, two. So that's what the header file will contain, decals of the sum function, the square function, the sum of squares from one, two function that I will not write out. And then you will take uh, the implementations and put those in the corresponding implementation file. So the, the sum of squares.cpp file will have the implementations of everything in the header file. That's the setup. implementations of, I don't know, all this stuff there, all right? So that's what we're doing there, and let's let's make this happen. Let us make this happen, because uh, I am going to make a bunch of files. Let's let's make a folder for this library in this, this example. I'll make a folder called sum of squares, and I'll move this thing that we just copied into there. So move sum of squares.cpp into the sum of squares folder. And so now it's it's in there. So I'm going to CD inside of that folder and start working there. So, uh, yeah. So I already have a sum of squares.cpp, but that's not holding what it should hold right now. So let's take uh, let's take the main function out, put it into a main.cpp file. First step. Dun, 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 main.cpp. And, I don't know. Let's take this get rid of that though. So here's the main function, be gone from the sum of squares file and put it here. Cool. All right. So there's that. I'll fix the error in a second. Uh, next we have the sum of squares.h file which would hold the declarations of all of the functions that we promised to, to put in our library. So these three, these function declarations, those should live in a header file which we will call sum of squares.h. Bam. And so I'll take all these and put them here. All right. So there's that. Uh, and then, I guess I don't need any of this anymore. And then finally, the sum of squares.cbp, that's what I've been working out of this whole time. Now all it has left is the implementations of all those things we declared. All right. That's the idea. So I've got three files right now. I've got sum of squares.cpp, I've got main.cpp that uses the library, and the header file that says what's in it. Okay? Any questions about this so far? Because it's not quite right yet. I have forgotten to include my library. That's the last step. So uh, main.cpp has no clue what I'm talking about when I'm asking for sum of squares from 1, 2, because it's like, I have no idea what function this is. What could you possibly mean? So we have to tell it about the function by including the header file. 
include sum of squares dot h. And now suddenly it understands, like it's going to be happy and it knows that this function exists, right? And then customarily, you include your header file in your implementation file, though it is not necessary for this particular example. It's just a good habit. All right, so here we go. Uh, let's see if I can split screen this well enough. Um, so we got... Mm, there. There. We have our main.cpp file. Here it is. It's using, it's including our library and using the file, uh, the, the functions that we implemented there. Next we have our header file, that one, and it is holding the declarations of all the functions for our sum of squares library. And then we have the implementation file that holds the bodies for each of those functions that we promised to be in our library. All right. Does that setup make enough sense to us? Any questions about that? Yes. So, so basically, the uh, the mm -hmm. that is basically saying this is what this function is. Yes, this and is then the, the, you, the you said. file is saying these are the functions here. These are the functions. That's that's all anybody needs to know to call them, right? Just like know what they take and know what they return. So that's that's your your promise to make these functions eventually, and then you need to go off in your implementation file and actually make them. Yeah. So the main .cpp yes looks to the header file and then looks to the um, .cpp. Yes, in a in a very roundabout way. Yeah. So to compile, all it needs to know is like what the functions look like. And so that's why all you need is the header file to look at. But to link, there is remember that there was a compilation process and a linking process, like the first day of class or something. Linking is where we give this implementation. It's a separate step. Yeah, that's a great question. Does that make enough sense for now? All right, any other questions? So let's compile this. To compile, we say G++, and we give all the implementation files. So we say main.cdp. Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong folder right now, aren't I? CD, sum, I made a sum of squares folder for myself. G++, sum of squares .cpp, and main.cpp. Those are my two implementation files. And I want to call their combined thing. Let's just call it main or something. And so now I can run main. So I've given two files to G++, two implementation files. Call the final thing main, and it's like, it works. It's happy. All right? It does the thing. Any questions about that now? So this is how you use G++. You're given all those things. And you don't, though, you don't give the header file. Let me show you why. So uh, when you do the number sign include, when you number sign include a file, and this is what happens when you're using library things, too. When you include a file, what happens is that it gets copied and pasted wherever you put that include. It gets copied and pasted right there. copied, and pasted. So that's why you don't ever need to say it anywhere else. Um, so legitimately, what's happening in... Uh, so here's the header file. Here is main.cpp, and here I'm saying sum of squares.h include it. So legitimately, what is going on when I say that? Oops. When I say this line, it is replacing it with the implementation right before it compiles. It's, it's legitimately copying and pasting it, which is fun. That's all that's happening. That's why you don't have to give it to G++. And so IOStream is just some big file that has, talks about C out, defines it somewhere. See it. It is getting copied and pasted, all right? Which actually allows for an interesting kind of error. You can get into an infinite inclusion loop, which is funny. Uh, let me show you an easy way that that happens, but uh, just know that it's it can happen much more subtly. And so this is why I'm telling you about it. So let's go back to this header file, and let's say something dumb. Let's be like, hey, sum of squares.h, you should include yourself. Hmm. And so do you see what's going to happen when I ever include sum of squares.h anywhere? It's going to copy and paste this, and then it's going to see the include again. And then it's going to copy and paste the file again, which will also have another include. And then it'll copy and paste the file again, which will also have another include. 
Does that make enough sense? So that's that's unfortunate. We don't want that. Uh, and you can get into the, you can get into trouble like this in a very weird way that is not obvious. Like this is obvious. You would never want to do this. But there is a way. You can have libraries that include other libraries in a certain way, and it, like this could happen one day. You could get into an infinite inclusion loop, and very interesting errors happen. Like I have an error in some squares that age. Also inside of some squares at each, I'm including it from here, from here, from here, like I'm including it this many times. And so it tried to include it 200 times and then it gave up, is what it's saying. So it's like, here's what's going on again. It's like, alright, when I include this file, it looks like this now. It's saying, alright, paste. Oh, looks like I need to include the file again. Alright, paste. It just keeps on doing that and there's still another include line. So that's, that's the problem right now. To get around this problem, you can give what are called header file guards. They look like this. They're a little weird. They're weird. They start with number signs. What you say this is like this is one of the few things in this class you kind of just have to memorize right now. It's it's so weird how this works. It's a very it's a relic of the C language, honestly. But what's going on here is it's making a special compile time variable. You say you say this if if ndef stands for if it's not defined. If foo h is not defined, you make a like you make up a name that's similar to your file name. So if foo h is not defined, define it, and then here's the body of it, and then you're kind of closing the compiler level if statement with this end. It's very weird, but if you just put this, the first time it includes, it will be like, oh yeah, foo foo h is not defined. I will define it. And then if it gets infinitely included again, like it gets copied and pasted a second time, it's going to be like, oh, foo h is already defined. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to keep going, if that makes enough sense. So these three magic lines prevent infinite inclusion, and so you will see them in every header file or some something equivalent to them. So here's here's the magic. Like, all right, let's make a some sort of big name. It's usually all caps, like you're shouting it out, if not defined some sum of squares can't have a dot in this name put an underscore though some squares age if it's not defined let's define it to be to exist like this is the body kind of and then end if it's like the closing brace on the compiler level if statement now it's happy now i, I can still have this and it's just going to see it a second time it's going to be like all right it's already defined i will not i will not run the body of this compiler level if statement for you and so it will compile, and it will run, and it is happy. All right, so that's the secret. Infinite inclusion, we don't like that, but uh, it is possible, and so we include these header file guards to prevent against it, right? Questions about any of that? Before I switch gears one last time to one, one final topic for the day. I just want to give a running, like a larger example, I think. Like this, all, we, this we wrote already. Let's do more. So here is a larger example. And I'll, I want to go back to that little counter thing that I made at the start of class. We can almost make what I made then. Uh, we don't quite have everything. We can't make our own types yet. We'll get there. But we can make our own functions. So let's make a, let's model a counter as a library. Like this little thing that, you know, you can click and it'll count up and you can like, get the count back. So... Let's make a library for this idea of counting things. Like, have an operation for clicking the counter. Have an operation for, like, resetting the counter back to zero. Have an operation for looking at the screen on the counter, seeing what we have counted up to. So that's going to be what we're going to make right now, right? So let's plan out all the functions that are going to live in this counter library, right? So first of all, the library is going to need, like, let's pretend that it keeps track of a single counter. So we will need to keep track of the count for that counter, like what's on the screen as we're clicking it. So we're going to put that in the CPP file so that only we can access it, only our functions can access it, but we're going to need to make a count variable. And it's going to need to be accessible to a bunch of functions, like we're going to need to make like an increment the count function, a give back the count function. And so this needs to be a global variable. We should start it at zero, definitely, right? But we'll put this into the CPP file. We need to initialize it to be zero. We're going to need a function to do that. So we'll make like an initialization function that starts out our count variable at zero. And like the goal is to only call that once to initialize everything. 
And then we should make like an increment function that takes our count variable and like whatever it is adds one to it, right? We can call it multiple times, increment it to two. We should also make a decrement function. So we can go backwards if we wanted to. We counted one too many times. Let's go back to one. So we'll this function is going to operate, these functions will operate on our count variable. And then we should maybe have like a reset button. Like every counter has that to just quickly go back to zero. It's like this thing on the side that you can spin, I guess. I don't know why I cannot draw right now. I think I just broke PowerPoint. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, I hope it saved, honestly. The last time this happened, it didn't save. Okay, I guess it's, it's still doing all right, at least on this slide. Uh, so let's stay here. And then uh, we'll, we'll also make a get count function because the count's going to be living in the library itself. We're, we're not going to give the user the idea that this exists them to go through our functions instead. So we'll make a git count function to like go and give it back. Here you can have it now. All right, so those are the kinds of functions that we want. And so if we spell them all out, like we're gonna make a counter library, call it like counter.h as our header file. Here's like the functions that we wanna make. We wanna make an init counter function, increment the count, decrement the count, reset the count, and get the count back. All right, so those are the, the five functions that we're going to implement in our counter library. All right, so let's let's make this happen. Let's pretend that we have it. Dun, dun, dun. So I'm going to go to another folder. Now this was like the sum of squares folder. Let's go back out and make a counter folder. I think that's what I want to call it. Yeah. CD into that. And let's do the same here. And so the first thing I want to do is like make this counter.h file. This is the library. This is what I want to do. Counter.h, include your header file guards, prevent against infinite inclusion, and then here are all the functions that I want to use. We need to think about their types now, though. Oops. There's all I need. We're declaring them, and then init counter should just like initialize the counter to zero. So void. Ink should just do a thing by itself. Void. Same with dec. Just goes and messes with the count. Same with reset. Get count is the one thing that actually gives something back. It gives back the count that we're building up. So that'll be int get count. All right. And so here's how I want to use the library. Let's make a main file. Main.cpp. That uh, like includes our library. Include counter.h. So we can use it. And then here's how I want to use it. I want to be like, um, init counter. And then maybe I'll like increment it three times. Now the count should be three, right? And then I want to decrement it. So I'll make uh, a call there. Now the count should be two. And then when I say C out get count, it should print that too. So just a very complicated program that prints two. All right. So that's the main.cpp file. Here is the oops, here is the header file. And then the last piece of the puzzle is to make the implementation file that goes in it. It makes all these things. It implements what it means to be these functions. Counter.h, sorry, counter.cpp. So customarily you include your header file, though it should not be necessary. For this particular example, but now let's let's do what we, we what we set out to do. So every our counter library is going to secretly hold on to this count variable that only we're going to touch. So we need to make that as well. Make it here in the uh, sorry int count. Make it here in the implementation file just for us. So there it is, and then we're going to go off and implement all of these things. So what should init counter do when we call it? Well, it should take our count variable. So that's what we're storing the counters count inside of, and it should set it to zero. So it means to like zero out the counter. It's a good initialization to me. Uh, and then what should the inc function do? It should mess with that counter variable again. It should increment it. Whatever it is, make it one more. Same with decrement. Whatever count is, make it one less. What should reset do? Technically, we could just have said, we could just have called init counter reset instead, but uh, just Morally, it should be two separate things. Uh, it'll make sense when we talk about classes one day. And then finally, get count, like we have this thing, 
It's just ours right now. It's global to this one CPP file. We can't see it anywhere else. So to give back the value, or to, to let the user use the count and actually see it, we need to return back our secret count, uh, our secret count global variable in this get count function. So this is going to be our library. That will be its implementation. And so, uh, yeah, I've got it. I've got the header file. There it is, declaring all the things that exist. And then here I have the uh, the main.cpp file that includes the library and starts using it. All right. Any questions about this setup? Make enough sense for now? All right. So what do I want? I would like to... Dun, dun, dun. I would like to run it. Now, I like to compile and run it. So to compile, I give both implementation files. The header file is unnecessary. I don't need to give that to G++ because it's being copied and pasted into all the CPP files anyway. So G++ main.cpp as well as counter.cpp and we'll call the output file main. again. And main does in fact print too. So we're initializing our counter to hold the count zero, incrementing it three times, decrementing it once, and now the count really is two. Right? That's the idea. So, that's a good example, I think. Good to study. Any questions about this code now that we've seen it run? Good enough? Because the last thing I want to do is go back to this idea from last time of testing. We just made a library. We made a bunch of functions. We should test them. We should make unit tests for each function, maybe. We should make larger tests that like test a bunch of their combinations of things. And so here's what I want you to do. We have time. I'm going to give you this code. Let me do that right now. And I'm also going to give you the assert true function. So let me do that before I forget. And I'll put it in main. I'll put the assert true function in main. And so let me do this. Uh, edit dot 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 slash dot 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 slash lecture. What was the one before this? Lecture 11. What? Testing dot cpp. I'm going to steal this assert true function. That's how you make a test. And so here I'm going to put it in the main.cv file. Oop. And it uses string, so I have to include string library. And so here's all of this. And let me give you all this code right now. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Don't worry about how I'm doing it, but I promise I'm doing stuff to give it to you right now. And then now, please, this is the easiest place that I could put it is on Canvas. So please go to Canvas, and it's on the, uh, the code from class. I uploaded today's files right now, just a little bit early. I'll, I'll put the final files on there later, but you got now's version. And so if you go to today's lecture, lecture 12, I believe, there it is. And inside of the counter folder is all of these files. Counter.h, counter.cpp, and really it's just main.cpp that I want you to mess with right now. I want you to turn what we just did into a test. All right, I'd like you to use that assert true function with our counter library and translate what we just did into a test. Trans make the test of saying or figuring out that running init counter, then ink, then ink, then ink, then deck, then get count in that particular order that should return back to when you ask for the count. See how that's a test? It's like, that's what should have happened. Let's make sure it happened. Can you turn that into a bunch of calls to our counter library as well as an assert true call? So give that a try. Ask me if you want, uh, have any questions. I'll give you a few minutes to try this and help each other. I'll give you a four minute head start, let's say. And then I'll show you what I'm thinking. So you're going to have to call the functions in that order, right? That's the first step. And then, what are you checking? Because that's what a search true needs. It needs what you're checking. You better compare what you got back from 
maybe git count, right, to what you expected to see coming from git count. more minutes. Alright, that was my timer. Did we get a passing test? Or is that maybe not enough time? You can keep working, but let me let me start. Let me do my my version. I'd like to use a search true to make a function. Uh, or to, to make a test. Turn all this into a test rather than, than printing stuff. So I'll comment out all this stuff and then the normal way, the normal place to put a test is you put a test in its own little function. So like you make a little, little test counter function. You package away what it means to do that particular test. So it is a void function, of course. Uh, what do I want to do in this test? I want to do all these things. I would like to call them all. I don't want to print anything though. All right, I'll let the assert true print stuff. So like I don't want to do a C out on git count. I want to test get count. Yeah? It's like, do all these things, and then get count should be holding two right now. Should be giving me back two if all of these things work together properly. All right? And so the way to translate that into an assert true call is you give the thing that you want to be true as the first argument. You say assert true. Get count's result should be two. That's what we want. That's what we're asserting. Better be the thing. Uh, better have been done. 
So, and then we give some description of our test. Be like, I don't know. Oops. Call it like counter test or something. But that's like a test. Run all that code. We better have ended up in this state at the end. So recompile. Uh, 40, 12, counter, plus, plus. All right, give all these things. Main.cpp, counter.cpp, call it main. Run it. And yay, we get our test passing. It really did give back exactly two. Right, so that's that's one test that makes us slightly more confident that our counter library implementation is correct. So naturally, you'd want to have many more than this, but this is a good start. Any questions about how I made that? Why I'm using a search true in that way? See how that translates to this uh, it's kind of English? This is what should have happened, and here I am doing those things and checking that it did happen. All right, if we are happy, I think that's all. That's what I wanted to do today. Functions, there's a lot to talk about for functions, and so it, we got one more lecture on them, it seems. So that will be a problem for Thursday. And it was just the lecture today. No new assignments out, so please keep on working on whatever is already out.